changes to the built environment played a significant role in helping us conquer infectious disease in the 19th century, especially if you look at like urban environments at that time. Um, and I focus in the book, particularly on New York, they were just hot spots for all sorts of infectious disease. By redesigning a neighborhood, we can nudge people into healthier behaviors through design. Hello, and welcome to Shared Space, a podcast about the power of architecture and design to make us healthier, happier, and more connected. I'm your host, Erin Peavy, and I'm so happy to have you with us. Today, I'm talking with award-winning science journalist and author Emily Anthes. Emily's work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Wired, Nature, and what feels like a who's who list of brilliant writers. Emily has a master's in science from MIT and a bachelor's degree in the history of science and medicine from Yale. I did not know that degree existed, but I'm really thankful that it does. It was very cool. And she lives in Brooklyn with her adorable puppy and cat who I've fallen in love with via Twitter. I'm just really excited to have her here because of the multiple books that she's published. Her most recent one is a serious gym and my version is seriously covered in highlights and notes and chocked full of aha moments and laughs and I am really excited to be able to share this with our listeners um, and it really is the best research, the way that you merge research and stories on how the design of our built environment shape our lives and our health. I'm just super honored to have you here, Emily. So thank you. Welcome to Shared Space. Oh, you're welcome. I'm so happy to be here. I thought that we'd start by talking about your journey. What's your interest in this topic? And what's your earliest memory of sort of being aware of the built environment? Yeah, that's an interesting and revealing question. Because as I say, pretty early in the book, I am and have always been indoorsy. You know, I was an indoor kid. Um, I didn't play sports. I like to curl up with a book and I've sort of grown into an indoorsy adult. Um, but despite that, I don't think I paid much attention to the indoor environment. And you know, testament to that is the fact that I'm not sure I could even think of my first memory of being aware of the built environment. And in some ways, that's what spurred me to write this book. You know, I'm a science journalist, and so I read a lot of the scientific literature. And I started seeing more and more studies coming out about sort of the science of the indoors. And that made me take a step back and realize, like, wait a minute, I spend so much time indoors, and I'm an indoorsy person, but I've never analyzed it or thought critically about my surroundings. Um, so I'm not sure I really became super aware of the built environment really until a few years ago when I started writing this book, even though that's maybe oh, a bit wow. embarrassing to say. <laughs> so what started you writing this book? So specifically, I was seeing some studies, and this was now maybe a decade ago, mm -hmm. but I was seeing some studies come out on what was being called the indoor microbiome. Uh, so microbe research, you know, has become, there's been a huge boom in that over the last decade or two. And, you know, in addition to traveling all over the planet into remote places, scientists were starting to go into our buildings and collect samples and sequence all the microbes that were there. Yeah. And their findings just astounded me. Like just the one study that I like to cite is the average American home has something like 2,000 different types of microbes. I cannot look at my shower head the same way after reading. I know, I know. Book. And so, you know, you could be grossed out by that. We can talk about why people don't need to be, but no, no. Th that sort of made me realize that my home is an ecosystem. And as yeah. a science writer, that fascinated me. And then I started to think about oh, well, like, what else am I missing that's happening right under my nose? So that was the the initial kernel. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. I, um, my father is a physician and a background in 
biology. I'm married to a biologist as well. And like, they just nerd out over that stuff. And so I had so much (laughs) fun getting to share that with them. So one of the things that, you know, you talk about in your chapter, Stairmaster, was the history about designing for public health. You share how the origins of public health are so closely intertwined with architecture and zoning and infrastructure and how we solve problems like infectious diseases such as cholera. And I would love to hear you talk about that link between public health and the built environment then and how you're seeing it now and how you think this has maybe changed and and how you'd like to see it change. Yeah, well, so I think sometimes people don't realize, though architects and urban planners might, but that changes to the built environment played a significant role in helping us conquer infectious disease in the 19th century. Um, You know, especially if you look at like urban environments at that time, um, and I focus in the book particularly on New York, which is where I live, but they were just hot spots for all sorts of infectious disease. Um, They were also filthy, you know, they were (laughs) extremely unsanitary. Um, There was often like no sewers, there was rarely indoor plumbing, Uh, there was, as you mentioned, no zoning, so you'd have livestock being marched down residential streets, and then, of course, there were these overcrowded, poorly vented tenement buildings, Um, and all of those things, as you can imagine, just are incubators for TB and for cholera and for yellow fever, and the sanitary revolution that came along at the end of the 19th century really helped tackle and bring down those disease rates. So, you know, you saw reforms like requiring that every room in a tenement building have a window that opens to the outdoors so people could get fresh air um, and zoning and, and street sanitation and street cleaning. And so, you know, I don't want to play down the role of vaccines and antibiotics, which which played a role too, but those actually came along later. And cities were able to bring down these disease rates before those innovations purely through changes to the built environment. Yeah. Um, What's changed now, um, at least in the industrialized developed world, is that infectious disease, and maybe it feels strange to say this right now, but in the middle of a global pandemic, (laughs) but Go on. In general, infectious disease is not, on a day-to-day basis, the biggest health threat. Um, you know, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, the biggest threats are things like heart disease and diabetes and vascular problems like stroke. And so what architects and urban planners have begun wondering is, well, can we use the same sorts of solutions or the same approach to redesign the built environment to help bring down the incidence of some of these chronic diseases. Um, And the early indications are yes, probably. Um, We, I mean, we now have a lot of evidence for several steps of that um, Mm -hmm. thinking process. So we know that like the ways that our neighborhoods are designed influence how likely we are to walk. Mm -hmm. And then if you redesign neighborhoods, you can encourage people to be more active I don't think we've quite gotten the final piece of the puzzle, which is difficult, but to sort of say by redesigning a neighborhood, you can bring down, you know, Mm -hmm. all cause mortality 30 years later. Like that's, as you can imagine, a (laughs) difficult time in the study to do, but there is accumulating evidence that we can nudge people into healthier behaviors through design. Yeah. And I, I think that that's so well articulated. And I'm wondering, you know, when we think about things like, um, you know, diabetes, for instance, and we think of all of the different interventions that are being thrown at this issue. And, you know, you had kind of mentioned with the pandemic, one of the things that we're seeing is that even though, yes, COVID is like the top of mind for everybody, what it's doing is stopping people from tr- like seeking care for a lot of those chronic conditions that, of course, haven't gone away, you know? Um, and so I'm wondering with something like that, you know, maybe if you could sort of talk about um, some of the things that you think were at the very beginning of how did our cities start to get carved up in the way that they are and where you know do you see those glimmers of hope um for for change 
Yeah, well, so really it traces back to, and the central culprit is really the car. Um, You know, once cars began to be mass produced Mm -hmm. and they became affordable and accessible to everyday Americans, then that had huge ripple effects on how we design not just our cities, but like our whole countries. People moved out of the urban core and into suburbs and suburbs began to sprawl. And if everyone has a car, then you don't need to make a neighborhood walkable. And we moved to sort of away from this mixed use zoning or even before that, no zoning Mm -hmm. to, you know, really strict um, divisions between residential areas and commercial areas. And so what you've ended up with are these sprawling suburbs where people you know, even just to go to the drugstore or the grocery store, you have to get in your car. Um, and, I, you know, I think about the, the house I grew up in in Northern Virginia was maybe only half a mile from the closest grocery store and drugstore. But because it was across this really busy road that had no crosswalks or sidewalks, you could never walk there, even if you wanted to. Um, and so those sorts of decisions have really sort of designed physical movement out of our neighborhoods. And that's had a lot of ripple effects. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things that people don't even realize about that um, is that, you know, we're seeing it in these, you know, chronic conditions, like we just mentioned, diabetes and heart disease, but it, those are also linked to loneliness. And the idea that, you know, when you're out walking you're able to interact with more people. You're able to feel more connected to your community. And that idea of, you know, you pull into your driveway, maybe pull into your garage and walk into your house, you miss that connection. And I'm really hopeful that that's a silver lining of what's happening right now for people to realize the power of their communities to, to be places that we can go walk or realizing like, that for some people it's not safe. It's still not safe to walk, you know? Yeah, and I actually I forgot to address that part of your question, but you know, there it's interesting what's happening now with the pandemic. I think even before that was happening, you were starting to see cities around the world sort of rethink like, well, can we prioritize pedestrians over cars and how can we shift the balance back? And I know just from my own personal experience, what like what happened in New York this summer was they closed down streets on the weekend and took away lanes of parking so they could put restaurants out. And it's just been lovely. And I hope that, you know, I know this is being done to respond to an emergency right now, but I think there's a lot of hope that the city finds ways to keep elements of that, um, even after the pandemic, because most of us are walking, especially in a place as dense as New York City, and it's a lot nicer. Yeah. And I, I feel like it feels where that's being done, it just ups the degree of liveliness. And like, it's hard to measure what that means to people, Um, you know, like to feel a part of something or connected or that like, I don't know, something's happening. I think, you know, we evolved in these societies where there was much more festivals and people gathering and people in the streets. And I think, um, it's pretty cool to see New York. I mean, the pictures there are just amazing. Um, and some of the slow streets movement, because it's like, ah, oh, this is possible, guys. Like, let's make this permanent, you know? Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned festivals, because I had, you know, friends and family who don't live here ask me what it was like here this summer. And obviously, in, in some ways, it was scary and depressing. And especially yeah. in the early days of the pandemic, it was horrible. But I actually said to a number of them, like, but this summer... F- in what certain ways felt like a never ending street. <laughs> you know, like that's really, there was this energy out there. Um, and I think it was really necessary, especially during such a, a difficult time. Oh, that gives me goosebumps. I love that. So when we talk about, you know, in your chapter, Full Spectrum, I think you do a great job of talking about sort of this intersection between universal design and the ways that we're thinking about designing for all and how designers, developers, property owners have traditionally focused on universal design or accessible design as just people that need wheelchairs. Um, But they haven't focused as much on those less visible differences. And I'd love for you to be able to share a few examples of 
what you think is the path to a more inclusive and universal design? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. So, I mean, to be clear, there's still a long way to go with even basic wheelchair accessibility. Oh God, like yes. we're, we're not even close to yes. um, good, having good that, that fixed. Yeah. Um, but there's been even less attention paid to autistic adults or yeah. people with PTSD or um, ADHD, epilepsy, migraines. All of those conditions and, and disabilities can affect how we process and behave in the built environment. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is it starts to become difficult if you think about like, well, there's so many different people and so many different sensitivities they might have. Like, how can we possibly design for wheelchairs and for autism and for ADHD? And that's just not possible. But what's interesting is that good design for people with these conditions is often the same as just good design. And so you can think about someone with autism or someone with migraines or PTSD being essentially unable to tolerate some of the bad environments that we've created, whether that's too noisy or too distracting or glare or not good sight lines. So all of those things are things that I think all building occupants yeah. would be happy to see go away. And, <laughs> you know, the, the classic example, which I'm sure listeners, some listeners are familiar with, you know, is curb cuts, which yes. were created for people in wheelchairs, but it turns out it's made it easier if you have a bike or a scooter or a stroller or a grocery cart. Um, so thinking about ways in which special populations might be sensitive to bad design can actually guide us to creating environments that are better for everyone. Yeah, well said. I I love that part about, you know, they're just less able to tolerate it. And, you know, I think of um, seniors, we think about, you know, the silver tsunami and how many people are going to be above the age of 65 very soon. And, um, you know, one of the things you've mentioned curb cuts, one of the other you know benefits is that for seniors stepping off of many curbs is dangerous. And we just don't think about that. And that this has been able to make it safer for them to go on a walk, to cross the street, to, you know, live an engaged life. Yeah. I mean, and that has to do even with just sort of like how appealing and friendly is a certain environment. You know, like there's some interesting research coming out at the neighborhood level of like, if you spruce up vacant lots and remove litter from streets, then that actually draws people out of their homes where not only do they get access to fresh air and nature, but they engage with their neighbors and this sense of community forms. And I don't think that's, you know, conscious decisions necessarily that people are making, but their behavior is being shaped by the quality of the built environment. Yeah, no, very well said. Um, so, you know, if we think about specifically taking like a microcosm of that and looking at the office design specifically, um, I think about how, you know, a lot of times we've been designing for connection and kind of seeing this backfire a little bit. Um, and with this rise of the open office, in part to you know foster social interaction and teamwork, um, can you talk about some of the research that you did around how this is backfiring and and maybe why it may be causing people to be more socially withdrawn? Yeah, so I think it helps to tease some of that apart a little bit. So, like, there is evidence that, and here especially like in an office environment that despite things like Slack and, you know, all sorts of other electronic tools we now have, that face-to-face -face interactions really remain the gold standard. Um, workplace teams are more cohesive and they perform better when they have more face-to-face -face interactions. So that's absolutely true. But then the question is, like, does an open, is an open office really the best way to foster these interactions? And I think there's some reason to doubt that. Uh, I mean, I will say that the research here is a bit contradictory. Yeah. Um, but I talk about a pretty compelling study that was recently done on a major corporation that moved from closed offices to an open office explicitly to promote interaction and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And what they actually found was after that redesign, face-to-face -face communication plummeted in this office, mm -hmm. and it was replaced by 
digital communication. So, you know, both instant messages and emails. Yeah. And there are a couple of reasons that might be. I mean, you can imagine if you're in this huge open space with everyone working quietly, like you don't want to be the one person like speaking out loud. You might worry yeah. that you're disturbing other people in the office. You might be worried you don't have privacy. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have a private conversation without being overheard or bothering someone, you take that to instant message. Mm -hmm. um, so by taking away those things that we need, like personal space and privacy, you're actually driving people more online and away from face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah. Um, not all studies have found that, but um, there's accumulating evidence that, that open offices can backfire in that way. Yeah. I, I think a lot about, you know, the understanding of group dynamics and that a lot of that may have to do with the scale. Like how, how many people are you able to see at once? How well do you know those people? How much time are you spending with them? You know, not to mention, are there things like conference rooms or little spaces that you guys can go into to have those kind of conversations and all of those layers? I used to actually study this topic in healthcare environments because, you know, team collaboration is essential. And yeah, the ability to be able to see one another is really important and can help to, to foster that. But does that just mean that it needs to be an open sea where there's no private? Because that, because to your point about PTSD or, you know, any sort of trauma informed design. And right now I think a lot of people are going through, you know, different forms of trauma. Like, we cannot just have full exposure all the time. Our, our our makeup is not to be comfortable with our back exposed to a bunch of strangers or, you know, people walking by. Well, and that does have implications for infectious disease spread as well. You know, like even before the pandemic, there were studies showing that people who worked in open offices took more sick days. And you can imagine why that would be, you know, if you don't have walls to separate you from someone who might be sick, you might be more likely to get it. And there's been a lot of talk about open offices now in our pandemic era and, you know, whether maybe we've gone too far in removing walls and barriers. So, um, when you start to think about like all of these things kind of merging into, uh, you know, you talk about active design and inclusive design and design for social connection, where you had mentioned a little bit about like seeing those synergies, like it's all just in good design. Could you maybe share what you see as that? Yeah, I mean, so there's sort of two different points here that might seem contradictory, but are, are I think are not <laughs> I'm ready actually for it. Contradictory. Oh. <laughs> um, so the first is that like there is no such thing as one size fits all design. Yes. Um, we all have different needs and sensitivities and even individuals like your own needs might change or often change throughout the course of the day. You probably want to be somewhere, maybe not right now, but when there's not a pandemic where you're like surrounded by people and energized for part of the day and then retreat to a quiet, you know, more meditative space later on. Yeah. Um, but that said, there are a bunch of principles that scientists have discovered that seem to be pretty broadly good for everyone in seemingly nearly every circumstance that sort of speak to our deep needs as humans, yeah. um, one of which is you know, to connect with nature. So bringing elements of nature into the indoor environment can have benefits for our physical health or psychological health or cognitive performance. Um, nature seems to make people more active. So other things that fall into that category are things like daylight or mm -hmm. um, good indoor air quality. All of those things are likely to be good for everyone and to have benefits that really range across the spectrum. So those are the sorts of things that I think we can pretty safely say, like we should be incorporating into all indoor environments, regardless of who it's for. Yeah, that's a great point. Do you find that those principles tend to relate to sort of evolutionary benefits or something else? Yeah, that's an interesting way of putting it. You know, like one of the takeaway lessons that I've been thinking about from the book, which is kind of ironic given the title and the fact that I'm in Dorsey, is like if you look what at what um, 
a lot of these ideas have in common is that one of the best ways to create a healthy indoor environment is to find ways to incorporate elements of the outdoor environment. Mm -hmm. Um, So that includes nature, that includes daylight, fresh air. And so, you know, I think one of the things that happened over the course of the 20th century for a variety of reasons is our buildings became really tightly sealed and they're basically like these hermetically sealed (laughs) capsules now. And, you know, there are good reasons for that, especially when you think about things like sustainability and energy. But I think we've probably gone too far in that direction. And so if you want sort of like an overarching takeaway, one of the things I think moving forward we should be thinking about is how do we create more permeability between indoor and outdoor spaces? And sometimes that might be literal, like, you know, outdoor walkways and open windows, but sometimes it might be metaphorical, like, you know, bringing in design elements that remind us of nature. Yeah. Um, so I think that's sort of one one big takeaway. Oh, I love that bringing in more of that permeability. I think that that's essential. And yeah, what does that look like? Maybe it looks different throughout the climate and yeah. and throughout the seasons, but having that be a part of um, part of how we think going forward. I love that. So climate resilience. And how it does really hurt the social fabric and hurt the ability for people to be connected with one another. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, maybe share some of those stories. You know, as design is often a series of trade-offs and there are different compelling um, you know, objectives and like absolutely creating a home that's not gonna flood in a hurricane is really important. Like I understand why. There were recommendations after Katrina for houses in New Orleans to be elevated even higher. But that has costs too, as you alluded to, um, especially when you think of the culture of that city in particular, where there are these shotgun houses with porches and a lot of the social interaction and community building happens on the street and at street level. And so when you remove that, you're not only sort of changing the character of the neighborhood, but you're potentially cutting community ties. Then there are other um, obstacles, like you have a lot of elderly people or disabled people. It might be difficult to go up two flights of stairs every time you want to go into your home. Um, So these sorts of challenges and drawbacks uh, spurred one engineer that I feature in the book, her name's Elizabeth English, to try to think about like, well, what are some other solutions? Um, And there are a variety of them. Um, It's not that hers is necessarily the best one, but she came up with, by studying some other communities that had already done this, a way to essentially amphibiate those traditional homes in New Orleans. So essentially what you're doing is creating a home that rests on the ground, but it has buoyancy blocks underneath. And if there's a flood, the house can float up on the surface of the water. And when the waters recede, it sort of lowers itself back down. Um, So it's a little quixotic and, you know, I don't know, will it become mainstream? I don't know, but I think that's the sort of creative thinking that we could be doing more of. Yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. I I mean, I thought it was, it was great. Thank you. Okay. If there is one thing in, in this overarching, um, kind of book and, um, topic area that you wish more people knew when they were designing, uh, around, especially how we think about social connection and the role of the built environment, what would you tell them? What do you wish that they kind of better understood? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, You know, I might have already uh, given this away, but I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that permeability lesson. Um, And I think we could even broaden that out from, so we want to create like, let's say homes and office buildings that aren't just more permeable between indoors and outdoors and nature and non-nature. But if you're thinking about community and social interaction that really allow us to move seamlessly and encourage us to move seamlessly between private space and public space and community settings and personal settings. So really thinking about, you know, it's not one design trick or tool, but like, how can we create, how can we break down some of the barriers in our built environment in, in all sorts, however you define those barriers to create sort of more open, inclusive spaces. I'm like, slow clap, slow clap. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That, yeah, no, that's 
Fabulous. Um, Emily, I just so appreciate your time. Um, is there anything else that you, you know, wish that I'd asked about or want to leave us with? I don't think so. I mean, I guess the only other thing I would say, and we've talked about this a little bit, you know, and obviously if I could, uh, snap my fingers and make the pandemic go away, I would, um, you know, it's the cost of, I'd appreciate enormous. that. But, um, <laughs> I hope that one of the very small silver linings is that it is making people think a bit more critically about the built environment and their indoor environments and yeah. that it's an opening to maybe apply some of these lessons we've learned. Oh, yes. Yes. Let us, that is, that is a sincere hope I have as well. I think people are seeing their own space in a way that they, they haven't before. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much. It has been an absolute joy and pleasure talking with you. And thank you for creating this book and for all of your writing, because it is a gift in this world. And I'm grateful. So thank you. That's so nice of you. It was, it was my pleasure to be here. It's great. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Shared Space. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a minute to subscribe wherever you're listening and head on over to Apple to give us a review. It really helps to spread the word and we really appreciate it. I hope that your day is filled with honest emotion, kindness, and connection. Thanks so much and take care.